show up Steve before I get down and go away and push up about six. Good evening, everyone. It's December 17, 2018. The 25th meeting of the 23rd Council will come to order. The first item we have is a roll call. All councilors are present this evening. Next item we have is a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance um, led by Councilor Sanchez. We have some special guests this evening. Um, the Albuquerque Boys Choir is here this evening to perform two Christmas pieces for us to enjoy. Would you all come up? And then I think Councilor Sanchez wanted to add something. I want to also thank the Albuquerque's, uh, Albuquerque Boys Choir for performing at the Angel Tree Lighting uh, this past week, so thank you very much. All 
Councillor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I didn't have the opportunity this evening to watch the voice and uh, Chevelle Shepherd, who was one of the finalists, but I was blessed to have the Albuquerque Boys Choir perform for the council this evening. Thank you. Yes, thank you. What a wonderful way to start a meeting. Um, civic, next item is Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the sign up table. The council will take a break approximately 7 p.m. this evening if needed. We want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks and please no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are all respectful of one, of, one another. Um, now we are on item three, proclamations and presentations. Um, we have a presentation from Jeff Hertz. He will provide us with an update regarding the Neighborhood Association um, Recognition Ordinance. Mr. Hertz. Thank you very much, Councillor President uh, Pena and members of the council. I'm going to give you guys a very brief update, probably just about a five, five minute update on where we stand in the neighborhood engagement process. And so I'm going to differentiate, first of all, those, uh, those who don't know, the NARO is the Neighborhood Association Recognition Ordinance and the neighborhood engagement process is, is the process that the city is undergoing right now to assess the narrow. And so there's essentially two overall goals, um, two, two goals of the NEP, the neighborhood engagement process. And one is to identify neighborhood association needs to help inform recommendations uh, to update the narrow. And then the second, and perhaps more importantly, is to establish an ongoing dialogue and long-term relationship between ONC, the Office of Neighborhood Coordination, and all of our neighborhood associations. Um, so we've hi the, the City Council has hired a consultant to accomplish a five-step process um, for assessing the narrow, and I'm gonna quickly go through each of those, those different steps. Um, the first, which really happened during March and April of this year, um, was an assessment of and a lot of background research on neighborhood association systems throughout the country and what their narrow equivalents look like. The second is conducting a series of preliminary interviews and surveys with city staff, neighborhood association representatives, and other like, uh, local stakeholders who are not necessarily involved with their neighborhood associations. The third, and we actually just, we, we just completed phase two and so we're, right now we're, we're moving, we're, we're looking to move on to step three. And phase three is really gonna be involving tailoring our outreach and engagement among all 260 plus neighborhood associations based upon their capacities and their priorities for making recommendations to the narrow. Um, the, fourth, the fourth and the fifth phases are synthesizing all of the data that we collected during or throughout the NEP process and um, in finalizing the report with recommendations to the narrow. And then of course the fifth is, is distribution of, of the final report. Um, and so we're, we, like I said, we re recently wrapped up with phase two. Um, we're, we're looking forward to moving on to phase three. Um, and a lot of this will involve everything from smaller tabletop discussions to larger convenings amongst numerous associations, neighborhood associations, um, to, to help identify what their, what their priorities are for the narrow and the future of their relationship with ONC. And we expect, we anticipate these next steps to be completed by fall 2019 um, to give us enough time for getting those updates to the narrow before the interim procedures deadline comes at the end of uh, 2019, beginning of 2020. So I, we don't have the consultant here today. Um, he, he would be the best to answer any questions, but I stand for questions as well. Thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. Hertz? No? Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Council. And next item is item four, economic development discussion. There is none this evening, so we'll move on to item five, administration question and answer period. Councilors, are there any questions for the administration? Council. Councillor Davis. 
Madam President, it's nice to say that. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask Ms. Nair if you would give us an update. Uh, we were discussing this earlier this week, and the administration and APD were able to make some uh, announcements over the weekend about our progress in uh, relieving our sexual assault exam kit backlog here in Albuquerque. I know that's been a discussion at this council for a couple of years now. We passed some new legislation to fast track the testing to help do grants. The administration made a priority of this and worked on it to add money in the budget. Um, and I think we're making some real progress, but uh, this has been that forum where we've kept the city informed. And I wonder if you could give us a really quick update on where we are with that backlog. And I, I see our commander here as well from the crime lab, maybe for any updates or questions. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, Council President Pena, Councilor Davis. So it was almost exactly two years ago, the first time that um, when the mayor was state auditor and I came and spoke to this council about the backlog of rape kits in Albuquerque uh, Crime Lab, which included 300 some kits from Bernalillo County and the remainder uh, from APD. And this council took a lot of action to try to move that pro uh, process along, to try to encourage the kits to be tested, to fund testing. Uh, unfortunately, over the next year, 2017, only 170 kits were tested out of that backlog of 5,552. So when we came into office uh, in January of this year, Mayor Keller issued an executive order asking the ASSERT team, which stands for the Albuquerque Sexual Assault Evidence Response Team, uh, to work with APD to come up for, with a plan for testing the entire backlog by the end of 2020. And they did just that. Uh, we also changed command staff at the lab and uh, got to give uh, thanks to Deputy Chief Arturo Gonzalez and Commander Chris George, who's in the audience, who now oversee the scientific evidence laboratory. I, I believe uh, Sergeant Amanda Wild from the Sex Crimes Unit is also back there. I want to express my thanks to her. So the good news is that uh, this year, um, APD has been able to submit over half of those kits for testing. So that's 2,874 2, kits have been submitted for testing. And there are still 2,678 kits remaining in the backlog, uh, which we are still on track to complete testing by the end of 2020. Um, but you can kind of think of the, each kit as being the, the center of sort of a whole ecosystem of other things that need to happen. And so we've uh, invested a lot of money in the point of the lab and a lot of resources in getting that part situated. But now we have to look at the rest of the ecosystem and make sure that we're investing equally all around. So we've done some work staffing up the um, sex crimes unit. And so we now have um, five detectives there, as well as two folks working on cold cases. So that's a good improvement for making sure that kids are moving that direction. We've also been able to staff up um, with some civilian staff who are able to take, take uh, care of the victim notification part of that ecosystem because that's also really important to make sure we're not re-traumatizing folks as their kids come back in. Um, the other good news is that the hit rate um, is double the national average almost here. So when we get a DNA sequence that's eligible for uploading into the national DNA database, which is called CODIS, um, then there are two types of matches that can come up. One is to a known offender, so we get a name, and one is to a known profile, which means they've committed a crime that has resulted in them being in CODIS somewhere else, but we still don't know who they are. And our hit rate uh, so far on the Al Albuquerque backlog of those two types is 20% compared to the national average of 11.8%. So I think it really speaks to how valuable it is to go back and test these kits. And we just have to continue to invest in the, our detective work and then to support the DA's office and, and the PD's office and the courts as they move these kits through the system. And I'm happy to stand for any further questions. Thank, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Ms. Nair and, and Madam Chair, uh, Madam President, thank you. I just want to say, I think uh, it's been great to see this. This has been a personal project of yours, and I know that's taken a lot of your time, and it's been well worth it. Um, I hope that as we move forward and talk, start talking budget, that, that we can work together on finding ways to expand that ecosystem. I think some of the data we saw that uh, more than 1,800 of those sort of cases have now been forwarded to the district attorney for review. Some are outside the... Uh, statute of limitations, but many are not, as you mentioned, and need some more work. And I think we're doing a great job. Um, <coughs> the department is prioritizing this, among other things. And so I hope you'll come back with a whatever ask we need to be sure that our team at the lab has what they need going forward and uh, that we can eliminate this backlog and not ever get to a place where we start a new one. So thank you for working on that. And thanks for that update. Any other questions for the administration? 
Um, I'll just add, um, add one thing. I don't need a response or anything, but um, the other day I got stuck in traffic going home. I have the good fortune of not having to go during rush hour, but unfortunately there was an accident on uh, Rio Grande and I-40, and it took forever. I, I want to say almost an hour and 45 minutes to get home. And when we were doing the art project um, with the last administration, they had talked about having some kind of a contingency plan, how we can barricade off the um, art lane and make sure that all the traffic um, flows more smoothly. So just something to think about. I would appreciate that. Thank you. Next item we have is item six, the journal, Councillor Borrego. Thank you, Madam President. I'm fighting a cold and I have been for a few days. Um, I move approval of the December 3rd journal. There's a motion and a second to um, approve the uh, December 3rd journal. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no, motion passes. Next item is item seven, communications and introductions. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. I move the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing R-115 on tonight's agenda for final action. R-115 is establishing legislative and budget priorities for the city of Albuquerque for the 2019 New Mexico State Legislature. Second. There's a motion to second by Councilor Borrego. Um, all those in favor, well, we need a vote, a two-thirds vote, um, two-thirds of the council um, vote. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item, I'm Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam President. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of introducing 047. 047 and referring it to the Finance and Government Operation Committee. 047 is granting a cable franchise renewal to Comcast of New Mexico LLC to construct, operate, and maintain a cable system in the right in the public right of ways and to provide cable service within a franchise area in the city of Albuquerque. There's a motion by there's a motion by Councillor Sanchez, second by um, Councillor Jones. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Councillor Borrego. Madam President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. There's a motion second for approval. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item is eight, reports of committee. Uh, that's me. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met met on Monday, December 10th, 2018, and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC-265, that it be approved. In the matter of EC-270, that it be approved and acted on at the meeting in which it is reported. In the matter of O-36, that it be without recommendation. In the matter of R-96, 99, and 101, that they do pass. In the matter of R-100, that it do pass as amended. I make a motion to accept the committee report. There's a motion and a second to accept the committee report. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item we have is deferrals and withdrawals. Councilors, are there any def deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I make a motion to defer R78, which is a nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 115 Charleston Southeast and move deferral until January 23rd. There is a motion and second. Um, all those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. The motion passes. Next item we have is um, item nine, the consent agenda, agenda. Are there any changes to the consent agenda? Hearing none, Councilor Borrego. I move approval of the consent agenda. Second. There's a motion and second for approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Um, now I'm going to actually change things around. Um, Councilor Winter, we are going to, um, under final actions, we're going to look at R-104. Councilor Winter. Thank you, Madam President. R-109 is establishing a standard citywide policy and fee structure for renting space in city-owned community centers, senior centers, and multi-generational centers. I move a due pass. Second. Um, and so, Councilors, um, what we did is we had a structure years ago that we brought up and um, I don't know if it was vague, but it wasn't followed. So what I decided to do was let the administration come up with their own structure and then present it to the council for approval. And if you all want to talk a little bit about that, um, we can do that and then move forward. Uh, thank you, Council President Pena, Councilor Winter. Uh, we're inviting a director of the Senior Affairs uh, Department, Ana Sanchez, up to make that presentation. 
Madam President, members of the council. Um, yes, this exercise was actually a very good study for the Department of Senior Affairs and Family and Community to undergo. Um, basically what you have before you is a very simplified, consistent um, category of, um, of um, areas in which to look at it to be, able to, to be able to make sure that we are consistent in our fees, also make sure that it's affordable. And we are very excited to be able to, to take this new step for our community members. Thank you. <clears throat> Council Winter. Um, I don't have any other questions. Anybody has some? Councillor Johns. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, can you give me a, a, just an overview, it doesn't have to be precise, but an overview of the change in the fee schedules uh, that are being suggested versus what are being paid now? So um, what we had before us was a very complex, um, <laughs> and I'm just pointing out just kind of what we inherited uh, initially to come up with four different types of categories. And ma ma mainly it's a $7.50 um, fee that is available for individuals if they are um, actually using a facility. However, there is categories of neighborhood associations that actually there will be no fees. So they're all broken down by basically individual or organization. And 750 is actually a much more simplified manner in which we are charging fees if it's, if it's being used for a private purpose. If I may, Madam Council President, Council. may I ask one more question from her? Madam President, may yeah, I Council follow Council. up? Thank you. Uh, and that 750, is that a day? Or what, 750, yeah, how much? A one-time use, a one-time use fee. As in forever? As, um, uh, the, they ask to use it, you charge them $7.50, no matter how long in that day they use it. Yes, we have, yes. Thank um, you. Yes. Sorry, that was confusing for me. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Gibson. Thank you, Madam President. So my question is of a legal nature. I see a bunch of attorneys out there, so I think I'm probably covered here. But um, so how is it that uh, we are not meeting the um, anti-donation. So let's say I teach yoga and I, I pay my, uh, what's expected of me uh, to do this um, and, and they're great rates and I'm glad that, I'm glad that we can keep them low and affordable for people, but how is that not conflicting with the anti-donation? Um, Madam Chair um, and members of the council, yeah. yes, if I could defer to Sarita here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Council President Pena, Councilor Gibson. I think that the concept is if you, the end user, are charging a fee for what you're providing at the community center, then we're going to charge you, and so there won't be an anti-donation issue there. Otherwise, you are basically contributing to the programming and the facilities, and the, the opportunities that are available in the, in the community center, and in return for that, we're waiving the fee. So there is a benefit to the city. So follow up, Councilor Gibson. If I may. Gibson. Um, so I, that makes sense to me. I guess what I'm, I'm struggling trying to understand is, uh, that it's not market. So my competitor could be doing it in a strip mall somewhere and spending, I don't know, $500 a month and I do it at our, one of our senior centers for a lot less. So that's what I'm wondering about. So uh, Councilor, Council President Pena and Councilor I'm Gibson, here. the anti-donation clause does not require you know market rates for anything. I think to, to the larger question, um, again, because the public is subsidizing those facilities, it does make sort of sense to me that we would provide them back to the public at a discounted rate, but certainly it's within council's purview to change um, the fee structure if it doesn't feel that's appropriate. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think we have a discrepancy between what you said and what's printed. Uh, it says the one-time activities, events, public interest, government, that are private and not open to the public, 750 fee per room, per room, per hour. Per hour. So that's not 750 a day. Yes, I apologize. Okay, and then there's another category, which is recurring activities, events, or meetings, any individual or agency in which there is a fee charge to those who participate, private or open to the public, $10 per room, $15 per gym and social halls per hour to include a $25 non-refundable cleaning fee. Does that mean that's included or it's in addition to? Madam Chair and members of the council, that's in addition to. 
Okay. And then there is large sale activities. I'm assuming that means scale. Large scale activities or events by individuals or, or for-profit organizations, which seems reasonable. $40 an hour, $50 an hour if it's over 50 people, $60 an hour for 100 individuals, $100 an hour for a specific park. Is, am I more, more nearly correct on the hourly versus the Yes, Madam, Madam uh, President and members of the council, yes. And those are applicable primarily for the family and community facilities. Okay, so let's say there's a small little family center in my district. Um, there are people who come there every week to play bridge for free. So are they going to pay $10 per, uh, per hour? Are they going to pay $40 per hour? They are going to play, pay the, t Madam Chair and members of the council, they are going to pay just the, the if it is a, if from my understanding, just to clarify the question, it's going to be a group that's coming together just to play and utilize one of the facilities together and, and socialize, correct? I'm not sure whether they charge people to attend or not, but it is a community of group. So would that community group, if they charge, if it's a paid membership to the group, does that mean that they now have to pay $40 an hour or do they pay $10 an hour? Madam Chair, members of the council, they will only pay the $10 if it is exclusive private for them for their, for their sole purpose and use. Okay, and yet it says here if it's private or open to the public, it's $10 per room. I think maybe we need to kind of get a, a grasp on the fee schedule before we start charging it because it's rather confusing in the way it's set up here. So. Uh, I think we might have a couple issues here. Mr. Rayo. <laughs> Madam President and, Madam President and uh, Councilor Jones, I think the, I, the idea here was to find a structure for these activities. Um, and whereas this fee issue may be a concern with a, an activity of that nature, um, if it's folks coming in uh, to use the facility on a daily basis and they have a a group of four people that like to play, um, they're just gonna come in as normal guests of the facility and play there. I think the idea we were trying to get here as per the resolution from the council when, and or the direction from the council is trying to find a structure for any of the activities so that we don't have folks uh, doing what Councillor Gibson described earlier, which is having folks come in and have an activity and make money from the activity using city facilities when there's a facility down the road. So if we need to go back and amend these a bit and maybe provide some clarification, we can certainly do that through an administrative process so that, so that folks know clearly. If you'd like for us to include more specifics as how those would be handled in this resolution, we certainly would be happy to, to defer it and, and we'll come back with an amendment to clarify those. Madam Chair, Madam President, if I may. I, th Jones. I think, uh, Mr. Rial, Ms. Nyer, before I could vote on this, for, before I could vote mm -hmm. yet on this, I certainly understand the intent, but we have any number of people who, mostly seniors, who come in and play cards, right. uh, and I think it <clears throat> needs to be defined very clearly who is who and who is what. If it's a business coming there, obviously they need to pay more. But if it's simply a group of old people like me who want to play cards or bingo or mahjong, whatever it is we play, I want to make sure that we are not charging these people for whom we build these, that we are not charging them too much in order to not get the businesses in there. Councillor Sanchez. Go ahead, Mr. Rail. No, I was going to say, Madam President and Councillor Jones, that is totally our intent as well. And again, if we need to provide more specificity to this, um, the challenge here is that in, a, in, a, in an ordinance like this or a, a resolution like this, putting all the specifics in terms of how you're going to administer the program can make this very, uh, uh, very uh, wordy, if you will. Uh, we can certainly pr uh, provide a backup of how those will be implemented and then give you all an opportunity to know how that's going to work. But uh, whatever the pleasure of the council is. Councilor Jones. Mr. Rael, I, I appreciate that immensely, but I have to tell you, um, I read things like this all the time, and if I can't determine which it is, I think some of our 16-year-old 
people at the front desk at our centers are never going to get this right and it will never be consistent. I think this has to be extremely clear so everyone who administers this does it fairly and equally. Thank you. Um, Councillor Sanchez followed by Councillor Winter, then Councillor Gibson and Benton. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, based on the situation with Councillor Jones and the senior citizens playing cards, many of these seniors are members and they pay a membership fee to the center or to the senior center. In that particular case, I mean, we've definitely got to clarify it because you're going to have your directors saying one thing and the rules are say, stating something else. So I would hope there would be clarity. But if there's individuals that are paid members of that senior center, they should not be charged an additional fee to utilize the facilities. So I still think we need some clarification. Councillor Winter. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Ms. Yara, and you've, you've read this legislation, mm -hmm. so can you kind of brief us on some of it? Uh, yes, Madam President, Councillor Winter. So I think I just want to clarify the distinction between um, people who are coming together in a group that aren't being charging their participants a fee. So I think the fee that's meant to be charged here is for people who are charging that fee for their own profit, so like a Zumba instructor, mm -hmm. et cetera. I wouldn't categorize a group of seniors playing mahjong uh, and having an ante in as a fee to participate um, for a for-profit person. So I think categories one and two would apply um, to those people who aren't charging a fee for profit and depending on whether that activity is open to all of the public or just a private group of individuals is where the fee difference is. So if they are, if it's open to the public, anybody can come and participate, then the room is free. Mm -hmm. If, if they, it's only a few, uh, it's only limited to a group of certain people, then they would charge 750 an hour. It's actually, it was actually Councillor Winter who had Madam the floor. President. And um, councillors in my previous life, we also did this at my previous employee, and it is a very difficult thing to do. And um, even after it was done, I thought we had a really good system, and we had to clarify a lot of stuff going through. And Councillor Jones, I absolutely understand we need to make it as clear as possible, but I think they've done a pretty good job. We can still clarify and let them clarify some things. So, you know, if we want to defer it, we can do that. But this is difficult, and there are going to be some things where they're going to have to make some changes on the fly. But I understand what you're saying. And what's going to be important is to make sure all the directors are on the same page with this and doing the same thing. Is that a follow up to that? Yes. Is that a follow up to that? Yes. Councillor Jones. Thank you, and I appreciate that. However, we're not dealing just with the directors. We are dealing with everyone at the front desk. Mm -hmm. and, and Ms. Yara, you say it's not people who pay a fee, but if it's a poker club, a bridge club, and it costs them $20 a year to belong to it, they are now paying a fee. So does that mean that because it's only their group who gets to come to this that they have to pay $10 per room per hour or whatever it is? I, I think it's so ambiguous that I could obviously argue either way. Uh, and I think that, again, you have some young people who aren't trained. You have old people who aren't trained on the desk. And I think the devil is in the details on this, and the details have not been cleared up. I Thank you, Councilor Thank you. Jones. Councilor Gibson. So I can appreciate um, that this is really difficult to, to, uh, uh, you know, to come up with this schedule of, um, of fees and who they're directed at. But, you know, I go into Palo Duro and the staff there know the people who are coming in. I think this is what's going to be, what's going to work the best is going to be very locally uh, at, the, at the, the senior centers. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously we don't want people not to go in and enjoy the senior centers because they think that they're going to, you know, get nickel and dime to death. But... Uh, uh, you know, we, I like the idea of at least recouping something back. Um, I love Palo Duro. I, it's clearly the best one in the city. But, uh, um, but really, I would like to get a, a little bit clearer answer on the anti-donation. Not because I, th that should stop what we're doing here or, 
or any of the activities at, uh, at the uh, centers. So uh, I would just be more in favor of, uh, you know, j just rolling this out. You know, it may not be perfect, and it, where it needs to be improved, we'll go ahead and amend it. And, Thank you, Councilor. And you all would be, be the ones to uh, guide us in that. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilor Gibson. Councilor Winter, did you have to add to that? Madam President, why don't we move a deferral till the next city council meeting, second. and then we can clarify some of these issues. There's a motion to second. Unless anyone wanted to speak beforehand, Councilor, it was Councilor Benton is next. I support the deferral. Yeah, I was just simply going to make the point that um, in Councilor Jones's example of, of the Bridge Club, um, that category three is a recurring, you know, this is a recurring event that's not covered, really, uh, if you think about it that way. And, um, and again, if it's, if it's uh, eight people who show and use the facilities and, and, and it's a casual kind of thing, that's one thing. But if somebody's reserving a room, for instance, and they're, they're making that room unavailable for somebody else to use, you know, then then there probably needs to be some middle ground in, in that kind of a situation. So just wanted to make that point. Councilor Davis. I don't remember the last time all of us weighed in on something so important. <laughs> it was a $7 <laughs> event fee. Um, but don't mess with our senior centers or God yeah, knows what. Right. We have to get this right in our community centers. Um, I, I support the deferral. I think that's great. I just wonder, Mr. Real, if I help. This reminded me that uh, last year the Parks Advisory Board was going to take up this issue for our parks as well, in part because we have a lot of for-profit, um, like Zumba folks and um, sort of folks that use our, our parks for their for-profit businesses, um, fitness businesses, which is great. That's why we have those fitness trails. But it raised some risk management issues under the old administration with some applications and some conflicting uses. I just wonder if we could also go through this process a little bit with parks to clarify that. It was a leftover item from the old administration, and I'm sure it hasn't been addressed yet, but just reminded of that. Madam President, Councillor Davis, we'll, we'll look at that as well. I, I just want to remind the council that, look, when we have public facilities like this, it is really a challenge organizationally to establish a policy that cuts across the board for every single use, uh, simply because North Domingo Baca is one of the facilities that gets a lot of use because of where it's located most of the end, and if I'm not mistaken, Manzano Mesa gets the other use. Yes. Most of the other facilities don't, don't uh, really get as much use as it relates to this sort of thing where folks are actually using our facilities to run a private business, if you will. And so it's hard to distinguish between, well, you know, you know Mr. Benton, you're, you're, you're a good citizen. You, know, you only do a couple of folks a week. It's no big deal. But, you know, Ms. Pena, you're doing it for profit. And then she looks and says, well, how come he gets to use it and we don't? You get into that whole conversation, so we're trying to weave through that, and I, I get the concern that you all have as it relates to who interprets the rules and having a, a real sense structure for this. But I will tell you that it will set some rules up, and there'll still be some folks who will be, there'll be some ambiguity in some place of this, so we'll work through it. Councillor um, Jones, totally I understand your concern, and we'll uh, see if we can put something more uh, stringent uh, on this bill so that you all feel comfortable with it. And Councillor Davis, we'll look at the, at the city parks. We're going to run into the same issues with the parks, for sure, but we'll work through it. Thank you very much. Councillor Borrego. Um, just for clarification, uh, Mr. Rael, can you tell us where this funding goes when, the, when, they, uh, when we assess fees like this in this form, this structure? Uh, sure, um, Madam President and Councilor Borrego, all of the, the fees associated with the programs eventually end up in the general fund because they're all general fund activities. Mm -hmm. So, Thank you, Mr. Rael. There is a motion by Councilor Winter for a deferral um, and a second by Councilor Sanchez. Do you have a time frame or do we have to establish that? When the next meeting? January 7th. Deferral until January 7th. All those in favor um, say yes. yes. Yeah. Opposed, no. Motion passes. So we are, are back under general, general public comments. Uh, there will be a two-minute time limit. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half. Then the bell will ring and the light will turn yellow, indicating you have 30 seconds remaining to wrap up your co comments. At two minutes, the light will turn red and ring to indicate that your time is up. The first speaker we have this evening is Mr. Don Schrader, followed by Suki Wampler, followed by Nola Haggerty. If you all can 
um, come up and get a seat here in the front, uh, we'd appreciate it. Mr. Schrader. Many years ago in Illinois, I wasted many precious hours hooked on television, violent westerns, money mad game shows, stupid comedies. I woke up. Since I first moved to Albuquerque 48 years ago, I have never owned a TV here. The main purpose of most TV is not to inspire, not to educate, not even to entertain. The main purpose of most TV is to sell stuff, not just the commercials, but especially the programs, the clothes people wear, their big houses, luxury cars, computers, smartphones, their shallow conversations. Have you seen any TV programs about U.S. low-income, real families now enjoying living simply and healthy. TV seduces people to buy, 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 to be somebody. TV keeps them ignorant about the millions abroad whose labor and resources are stolen by the United States to feed addiction here to always more stuff. What good are superb acting and technical production excellence when programs glamorize greed, war, murder, rape, jealousy, revenge, booze, junk food, and stuff we do not need. I know I miss some good programs, but I am glad I own no television. Thank you. Um, before we move on to Suki, I'd like to actually call up Lori um, Galria to speak first. Hello. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Lori. I'm 10 years old. I'm a member of the Global Warm Express at Mount Mahogany Community School. Did you know that we are behind on banning plastic? Europe has banned single-use plastic. Santa Fe has banned plastic bags. Now it's Albuquerque's turn to do something good for the earth too. We need to ban plastic waste or else our earth will suffer. Look around, what do you see? I see children and adults who are here to stand up for what's right. I see children who want to live in a world that has not been ruined by plastic pollution. The earth has no voice. I'm the earth's voice. Thank you very much. Thank you, that was excellent. Thank you. Our next speaker is Suki Wampler, followed by Nola Haggerty. Hi, my name is Suki, I am eight years old, and I am a member of the Global Warming Express Club at the Mountain Mahogany Community School. I love going for walks in my neighborhood, but every time I do, I find lots of trash, especially plastic bags. I find them in trees, bushes, fences, cacti, even in storm drains. If storm drains get plugged with plastic bags, it will cost our city money to fix them. If the city doesn't fix them, Albuquerque can flood any time we have a heavy rain. I want to ban plastic bags from Albuquerque because if Santa Fe can be without them, we can too. <laughs> Thank you. If you could hold your applause. Uh, Nola Haggerty. Hi, my name is Nola. I'm eight years old and I go to Mountain Mahogany Community School. I'm in third grade. I am a member of the Global Warming Express Club. I enjoy dancing, ice skating, and gymnastics. I love spending time in nature. I am very concerned about the overuse of plastic bags. Have you ever seen a field almost covered in plastic bags? There is one in Edgewood that I always notice. I know one store in Albuquerque that did not hand out plastic bags unless you pay for them. And I think that is a great idea. I think many more stores should do that. Did you know that plastic bags take so long to decompose that they pollute more than almost anything else? They end up polluting our lakes, oceans, streams, rivers, and the air. 
Let's try to use more reusable and paper bags instead of using plastic bags. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Kaia Tulili? Tule, followed by Stella um, Sledgeguba, followed by Ashley McKenna. Hi, my name is Kaya. I am eight years old. I go to Mountain Mahogany Community School. I am a member of the Global Warming Express, Express Club. I love spending time outside in nature. Uh, I care about animals and our planet. I am very concerned that we are using too much plastic. Making plastic emits CO2, which is bad for the environment. Plastic pollutes our lands and our oceans, as well as harming and or killing animals and fish. Did you know that 300 million tons of plastic are made in the U.S. each year? Half of this plastic is made into single-use bags. I want others to reduce their use of plastic. Let's use reusable shopping and produce bags. Thank you for helping our community and planet. Thank you. Stella. Sledgeguba. Hi, my name is Stella. I'm nine years old and I'm a member of the Mount Mahogany Global Warming Express Club. And I have a concern about how much plastic we've been using because every time we make plastic, we burn fossil fuels, which goes into our atmosphere and causes global warming. And since we've been making a lot of plastic, it ca it's causing us to breathe poisonous air. And so I think instead of using plastic bags, we should use paper, cloth, or fabric bags. And I think that that about currently, about almost every store is starting to sell them. So we can reduce and stop making so much plastic. Thank you, Stella. Next is Ashley McKenna, followed by Rachel Zulibai, followed by Jonelle Eubank. Hello, City Council members, Madam President. Those girls are so amazing, amazing and I have a paper <laughs> so um, my name is Ashley McKenna and I started the petition for Albuquerque to ban, ban single-use plastic bags as a mother and a counselor here in Albuquerque I'm concerned with the overwhelming environmental impact that plastic bags do have on our earth and as a community we need to create an environment that will support all future generations to come since starting this petition, I have heard from so many citizens, the young ladies who are up here with me and other groups from the community that feel strongly and want to make this change here in Albuquerque to reduce our use and waste. So tonight we are here to have our voices heard and we will continue to educate the community and push for legisla legislation on this issue. Stopping single-use plastic bags can reduce our use of petroleum, protect our oceans and rivers, and stop the harm harmful chemicals from entering our bodies. So this is a realistic change that we can make. Um, other cities in New Mexico, Santa Fe, and Silver City have made this change, and other countries around the world are doing the same rather quickly. Um, and we can use them as a model for Albuquerque. So today, I am kindly asking the city to consider and create legislation or an ordinance to ban plastic bags or tax them, which has been proven to be effective around the world. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Gibson. Uh, Ms. McKenna, may I just ask one question? It was, we had coffee last week, I really, really enjoyed that and, and um, hearing what you had to say about this. And I just want to clarify that that um, uh, it was another municipality who tried to prohibit totally the plastic ban the plastic bags, but that was uh, uh, struck down in in court in the Supreme. I believe you said it was Supreme Court. Is that correct? I am quite sure it was Austin where that happened. I know that there are other organizations that's standing behind me that might have some more information okay. exactly, but I think Austin. All right, well my question is this then. So we can't ban them, but what we could do is um, tax them. Or, you know, charge a, a certain small amount per bag. And, and what has been the effect, that's what's happened in Silver City and in, in Santa Fe, correct? 
Uh, Councillor Gibson, so Santa Fe did ban plastic bags, but in their ordinance, they have different language about who can use plastic bags. I know um, the SNAP program and different um, homeless agencies do are able to use that. Um, so I think that really comes down to the details of the ordinance that the city council would put together and pass. But there have been bans. Um, I think in Austin, um, they had to fight a little harder for that ban, and it was revoked, and they were able to move forward with a tax. Okay. All right. Thank you. Of course. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker is Rachel Zulivai, followed by um, Jonal Eubank. Thank you, Madam President, members of the council. Uh, my name is Rachel Zulevi, and I am here today also to raise my voice in support of either a ban or a tax on single-use plastic bags here in Albuquerque. Um, I am here today on behalf of Zero Waste of New Mexico. It is a group um, that I started on Facebook about 11 months ago when I felt isolated in my urgency for action to reduce the amount of waste that I produce in my own life. People have been coming to this group over the last 11 months. We actually formed a volunteer project where we partnered with the down Albuquerque Downtown Growers Market, accepted, donated unwanted t-shirts from the community, and sewed them into reusable produce bags to help the Albuquerque Downtown Growers Market move away from the single-use plastic bags at the market. The reception from the public was amazing. We distributed 500 of these handmade upcycled bags with zero environmental footprint over the course of four weeks in the month of October. And the feedback was, was that this is a, such a good thing to do. We don't need plastic. We should move away from plastic. And people said that they, they had this intention, but they often would forget. They would forget to bring their own bags to the grocery store. Um, this is an awesome way to help people remember uh, they have this intention, they have the capability to adapt to a lifestyle that, where this is the low-hanging fruit. This is something we can easily do to reduce our plastic production here and our, our dependency on single-use, flimsy, non-recyclable plastic in Albuquerque. I'd also like to mention, and I hope everyone knows, that these kinds of plastic bags should never go in our recycle bins. Uh, they, can cause, they can wreak havoc at our local recycling center. Um, Taking them out of the picture altogether will have so many wins across the board. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Jonelle, Councillor Gibson, did you? Oh. Um, Jonelle Eubank, followed by Angela Davies, followed by Ralph Warns. Thank you, Councillors. My name is John L. Eubank. I have been in, living in Albuquerque in District 8 for the past three years. And I am here today to ask you to ban single-use plastic bags in Albuquerque for the good of all life on our planet and right here at home. We all know that plastic bags are murdering sea life around the world, but living in landlocked Albuquerque, it can be hard to believe that our plastic bag addiction is contributing to this problem. Know that it is, but I actually want to focus much closer to our home. Recent scientific evidence has demonstrated that discarded plastic bags now outnumber reptiles in the American Southwest Desert, including here in um, New Mexico. Sonoran Desert tortoises are particularly at risk because they, like their ocean-going relatives, eat and become entangled in plastic bags, leading to slow and excruciating death. And American crows use plastic bags and shreds of plastic bags in their nest building, and their babies also regularly eat and become entangled in these remnants. Um, the study of plastic bags impact on life on land is just beginning and we can expect many more horrifying stories like these. And you should know that plastic bags also contaminate our water, um, which is the most pre precious thing in the desert. These bags break down into microplastics which easily absorb toxins in the environment. When a creature drinks that water or worse has to live in it, they also absorb these toxins. And know that the microplastics from plastic bags have not only contaminated our water, but also our food chain and the air we breathe. All living creatures, human and animal, and plant, are being impacted by plastic bag pollution. And know that better recycling is not the answer. The resin generated by recycled plastic bags is next to useless because the plastic is so degraded by the process. The solution, like Rachel said, is to stop using plastic bags altogether. Albuquerque can join a growing global community that is beginning to address some of the harm humans have done to our home, all of our homes. So please ban single-use plastic bags in Albuquerque. Thank you. 
Thank you. Angela Davies, followed by Ralph Warns. Hi, thank you, Council. My name is Angela Davies. I'm a student at UNM and a resident of District 6. I'm here with so many fellow members of the community to ask the Albert Kirky implement a single-use plastic bag ban along with a fee for paper or compostable single-use bags. The motivation for this comes from the distinct recognition that plastic bags are a human-created problem that have effects that permeate all layers of the ecological community that we are just one part of. Single-use plastic bags are an unnecessary convenience item that promote extractive, destructive, and ultimately unsustainable practices. The Council has a clear opportunity to help the City of Albuquerque shift and grow into a more generative and sustainable future, and a single-use plastic bag ban is a really simple part of that. Support for shifting Albuquerque into a more sustainable city is backed by this community, as you can see from everyone who is present today, and also has support from Mayor Tim Keller, who, according to the city's own website, has a goal of, quote, weaving sustainability into the fabric of our actions here at the city, and who is also quoted as saying, with all of us working together to make small improvements, we can create a better future for our children and community. I agree with Mayor Keller. We can create a better future, a future that embraces a community as something that includes the greater ecological world outside of us, with ourselves and our friends and neighbors as just one element of that greater whole. Plastic bags are harmful to our community, and we have an obligation to do something different. Thank you. Thank you. Ralph Rorns. Followed by Vicki Kaufman, followed by Simon Palokowski. Um, hello, Madam President and Council Members. Um, I actually had some brief prepared comments. I had some brief prepared comments, but a lot of it has already been said. Um, I just want to say that I concur with all the previous speakers and some of the very um, excellent comments that they have made. Um, I'm a grandfather and a father. Um, so I, a lot of things that I've done over my 28 years of living in Albuquerque has always been to um, do things for our future generations. And I think this is one action that the City Council should uh, please consider doing. Um, I was you know, talking about the necessity of a citywide ban on single-use plastic bags, which you've already been hearing about. Um, I think you've also heard about the fact that this, these plastic bags, they break down and they stay in our um, ecological our ecology for a long time uh, they have a 12 minute lifespan from the time that they're received at the store until they're discarded then those same plastic bags can take anywhere from 10 to a thousand years before they finally decompose um, and also mentioned I think some of you uh, here on the council have heard of the worsening burden on the world's oceans and seas from plastic pollution and also as it was said it's kind of hard to can think about that when we're here landlocked in the New Mexico area, but we all, you know, all these things find their way to the ocean if they're not. And then what we're also hearing is that they are not uh, really um, effectively uh, recycled. So that's one thing that we also can consider. Um, it was also brought up that Silver City and Santa Fe um, have also enacted um, bans on single-use plastic. According to Forbes magazine, they are one of, or they are two of 345, 349 cities, counties, and states in the U.S. that have enacted bans. So there is a lot of, you know, good evidence to draw from when you would go about drawing up a ordinance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Vicki Kaufman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President, members of council. I just wanted to demonstrate my f most favorite birthday present that I got as a 65-year-old senior. It carries five of these bags and hangs on your, it, the most innovative thing I can come up with, but I've been, my whole car is full of reusable bags. I will <coughs> never, ever bring a plastic bag out of a store at this point in my life. I feel ashamed to be of the generation that introduced plastics as like the biggest, best thing coming from the graduate, the movie. Um, but in fact, we didn't foresee the damage it could do. And at least banning these bags 
would be our first step in showing our generation is listening and wanting to make change for these children, okay? Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. Simon Polakowski. Followed by Annie Hanna, followed by Liam Castron. Council President, Council, uh, if you public is in charge of public access, then a fraud is being perpetuated on the city of Albuquerque. And this has been continuous for over a year. I'd like to comment, uh, hopefully these children, these young pupils will uh, return here someday as maybe high school students and have to write a paper, how does city council work? And this will be a prerequisite from graduating from high school civics class. And maybe they can write a, a public comment also. Uh, that being said and done, uh, this being the holidays, I thought, well, I, I, with the art project 18 months not being used, I thought maybe we could hire, the city of Albuquerque could hire maybe the Installation artist Christo, and he could wrap it for us from <laughs> Coors to Tramway. But of course, this is plastic, and all these people are against plastic. So I thought maybe we could ask uh, the citizens of Albuquerque to maybe come out on Christmas and with toilet paper rolls, and they could wrap each individual station. And this would be a symbolic gesture of, gesture of what they think of this project. And you know, I see everywhere, uh, you know. There is no poop fairy, but for the government, when government uh, does one, the average taxpayer picks up the tab. So again, you know, I believe that uh, we need a public access station that provides a podium for the average citizen to voice their views and to get you know, an audience that they can find out that there are many people who think likewise about these issues. Uh, you know, very few things are written. I went to a water meeting with uh, Kirkland. There was no representation from the three local TV stations and a city employee commented, I would like these uh, meetings televised. So we need, uh, the people need to be informed. Thank you. Thank you. Annie Hanna, Liam Kastrom. Hi, Madam President and members of the council. I'm so happy to be here with my four kids. Um, I've always been interested in environmentalism um, since I was their age, but I think now as a mom, it's taken on such a greater sense of urgency and deeper meaning. Um, I think as parents, we're always concerned for our kids, so they might get a scrape or they might, um, you know, they need to, to go to piano or they need to go to um, get their meal ready in a time. There's so many things that we have to do as parents, but I think it's important to step back and see the bigger picture that we need to take care of our planet for them and have a healthy planet, you know, a clean water, clean air. This is their future and our grandchildren's future. And so that's why I'm here today. I think um, there's three things why I think our city should move towards reusable bags. One is beauty. We're the land of enchantment. We don't wanna be like the land of plastic and our, drain clogs, our drains clogged with plastic and the Rio Grande having microplastics in it and getting into the food chain. Second, sustainability. What we're doing right now is completely unsustainable. Um, only 8% of bags are actually getting recycled. Um, we need a sustainable solution for our city. And number three, we want to be a leader. Um, we want to join the other uh, municipalities and countries that have already been listed, Austin, Chicago, LA, New York City, Boston. Um, we know this change is coming, and we want to be on the vanguard rather than left in the dust. So let, as um, my, one of my favorite writers, Rebecca Solnit, said, let's not wait to see what happens. Let's be the change that we need to happen. So let's have Albuquerque be the change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Liam Kastron, followed by Alex Hanna and Adrian Hanna, and then Athena Hanna and Adriana Hanna. <laughs> Hello, Welcome. I'm, thank you. Hello, my name is Liam Castor and I'm nine years old and this is my speech about plastic bags. The good things about plastic bags is that they are cheap, 
and they can hold a good amount of things and they're easy to carry. But the fact of the matter is they don't keep a sustainable environment because they're not recyclable and when expected to end up in the trash, you see them on our beautiful mountains and city. So the environment, so we need to have a conclusion and use paper bags. The good things about paper bags is that they have all the benefits for plastic bags and are better for the environment. In addition to using paper bags, we should influence people to bring in cloth bags to stores or even an old backpack to use. The thing about, and that was my speech about plastic bags. Thank you, thank you. The next speaker is Alex Hanna. A plastic bag is waving through the wind and plump, it lands in the Rio Grande. A few years later, it turns into small particles of plastics called microplastic. Some fish are swimming along. They eat the plastic, and now the fish have plastic in them. Some fishermen are casting their poles. They get the fish with plastic in them, and they go to their nearest seafood restaurant trying to sell it. Now, be careful when you're eating seafood, because you might just be feeding yourself plastic. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Adrian Hanna. Hello, my name is Adrian, and I am 10 years old. As I, my mom drove here, I saw plastic bags scattered on the side of the roads and blowing in the wind. I thought, we do not want to live in a trash dump. We want to live in a beautiful city where tourists from all over the world come to take pictures. We, we want our kids and grandkids to live in a nice place, not in the mess that we leave for them to suffer in. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Athena Hanna. Hi, my name is Athena Hanna. I'm eight years old and I'm in second grade. Eight million tons of plastic bags go into the ocean every year. And when I go to the beach in San Diego, I want to boogie board and surf. But, but there's plastic bags everywhere. I end up my, with my time picking up plastic bags. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Adriana Hanna, followed by Sarah Wells, followed by Tad Naminsky. Hi, my name is Adriana Hanna. I'm five. I'm in free k <laughs> <laughs> but don't use this bag. <laughs> Thank this you. Bag to loop. Uh -oh. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Wells. Hello. <laughs> Panic. No planet. No life. No moment. We are but moments, you see. Now imagine these moments. Like these bags, each one made, each one held on to, each one so precious and bundled up and tucked on a shelf. Now if these moments were immortalized, imagine their effect on history. But if we keep collecting and if we keep storing these bags, in we will keep collecting all these precious moments that we will never part with, that will stack up. They will not break down. And we will be drowning in these moments. Our history will not be covered in dirt, but strangled by plastic. Make room for memories. Move over plastic bags. Thank you. Yeah. Next speaker is Ted Naminsky, followed by Josephine Graff, followed by Amelia Babic.
Welcome, Mr. Naminsky. Thank you. <clears throat> well, why don't you throw it these paper bags, paper cups on the Central Avenue? We need it over there on the art. Well, how many wants to, what's that nonsense, wants to carry bag, workers, et cetera, et cetera, walking with, with the bags, all kinds of bags. <sighs> That's one of my points. ATD, pro, for profit. Well, let's, let's, before last city council meeting, they were filming on the south side downtown. That what hundreds of during that, those days, APD vehicles, cops full in form with hardware. And one, he said, when I approach, he said, "Listen, he start pleading me. I did, I didn't, I didn't do anything for it, for you. Why you? That is my time, not yes. That's your time, your free day. Oh, your day." But uniform does not belong to you. Uniform hardware doesn't belong to you either. Vehicle doesn't belong to you. So all go to city council, complain. Yes, city council. How much waste? Taxpayers' money. More cops. We have plenty cops. And plenty cops wants to do overtime. They are working for movie industries, non-profits, Walmart, Home Depot, everywhere. That's where we at with those corrupted city council. Thank you, Mr. Naminsky. I'm Josephine Graff, followed by Amelia Babic, followed by Marianne Dickinson, and that will be the last speaker of the evening. Hello, I'm here just to thank you all for considering the proposal that was presented tonight by Ashley McKenna and others to ban single-use plastic in Albuquerque. I also want to thank to urge the city to ban or discourage the use of bags as a first step and to come up with a plan to ban or at least reduce other single-use plastics to encourage the use of cloth bags and to create legislation to go into effect in the very near future. Thank you. Thank you. Amelia Babbitt. I'm Amelia Babbitt. I'm in fifth grade at MRGC, and I want to help our environment. I know that some people here may agree with this change of banning or at least taxing plastic bags here in Albuquerque, and some may not. I believe that it would be a good change. Plastic bags affect our environment, animals, and us. If you have ever read through a cycle of a plastic bag, from being made to being thrown away. You will then know that it is not just the bag that affects the environment and us. It is also the manufacturing. For example, the oil companies burn oil to create the plastic releases carbon dioxide. It also affects us in many ways. Since plastic bags usually cannot be recycled, they end up in the ocean, forests, landfills, or even someone's crops. For from here, the chemicals in the plastic can be released, sometimes into our water system or even into our food sources. Also, many animals confuse the plastic bags for food since they move around a lot in the wind due to their light weight, and sometimes even get stuck. And sometimes they even get stuck in them, ending in suffocation. Many people don't notice how many places the, that bags are used for the most from the most obvious stores. To one people don't notice often, such as trash cans. This is only getting worse. Imagine your grandchildren and their children and how the world would look then. Unless we, want, unless we start to unravel the problems we've caused, the banning of plastic bags here in Albuquerque would be a great start. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. And before we move on, I just really want to um, applaud all you young boys and girls for being here today and advocating for something you truly believe in. So thank you. Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam President. And um, yeah, thank you so much, everyone who spoke. It's so moving. And um, I've been on the council for a while now, and 
I, I have to admit that quite a few people have come up to me and said, Councillor Benton, would you take this on to ban the bags and, and ban plastic bags and regulate these, these plastic wastes? And, and I've usually said, I think I almost always have said, I've got a lot of things on my plate right now, but if you can get some other counselors, I will join them and happily promote such a, such a, a bill. And I think we've got, I think I see some faces here that might be ready to get it, that introduced in the next uh, couple of weeks. And of course, we wanna speak to the administration about it because they would have to administer such a, such a ban. So, uh, but I'm very, moved by what I heard tonight, and I stand ready to work with other counselors to, uh, to come up with a resolution or ordinance or whatever it's gonna to take to get this done. If you can hold your applause, please. Um, Councillor Davis. Thanks, Councillor Benton. I agree with you. I haven't been here quite as long as you have, um, but I've heard some of those same calls too, and I'd be proud to join you in getting that started if we can uh, find a way to get that introduced and start having hearings to find some best practices on cities that have done it well, and how we might apply that for our city as well. Councillor Sanchez followed by Councillor Bredegel. Thank you, Madam President. Albuquerque's future leaders arrived tonight at Albuquerque City Council meeting, and I wanna thank you for all your work. I mean, it was very impressive to hear each and every one of you speak. You were, you were eloquent, eloquent, you were right on target, and you provided a lot of valuable information to this council. I wanna thank your instructor who brought you down, because I mean, there's a lot of work that's involved and the time that you guys have taken on this important initiative to come down and take the time and arrive at one of our city council meetings. But I can tell you, we've got future leaders of Albuquerque right here in the audience tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Councillor Borrego. I'm really delighted to hear so many young students and young future leaders speak to us tonight about this particular issue. Um, I often shop in Santa Fe because my mother lives in Española, so I stop at Trader Joe's on the way up to Española. And I um, often carry my own little bags into the store. Sometimes I forget them. But it, uh, you know, I am absolutely supportive of this particular issue. I think that plastic bags are, are just, um, you know, I see them in the Amafka drains and they go right into our drinking water and, you know, to hear this, um, one of the, the kids who talked about, um, you know, what we're eating, I mean, absolutely, the fish are ingesting and we're, we're um, ingesting as well. So I, I definitely would support this and I would like to co-sponsor as well. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Borregos. Um, Borrego, thank you, thank you for being here. Our next item is item 11, announcements. Uh, Councillor Jones. Wait, we have another speaker. Did, did I miss a speaker? Oh, yes. Oh, I apologize. Is this Marianne Dickinson? Yes, it is. I am sorry. <laughs> and I was going to have the last word on the, <laughs> on the bag. There you go, um, well, you do. But I would also, before I have my first, my last word, I would like to also stand for um, supporting um, R18105. I am an Amtrak user, and I have seen many, many people who need that service, and I hope that the city will support the continuance of that service to, through Albuquerque, through the Southwest. Anyway, um, about the bags, um, it's not really hard to carry one of these in your pocket or your purse, and uh, uh, yeah, just get the snap undone. So it's not really hard to, to actually replace the plastic bag with something reusable, something that's easy to carry. But um, I think I would like to urge that when you're thinking about an ordinance, you think about that it be in, in collaboration with the county, that it's probably more effective if we do it countywide, and that maybe you think about plastic bags as a nuisance. Um, they are a nuisance, besides a hazard of many sorts. Um, and I've been a long time recycler, and I know that it's pretty useless thinking about recycling plastic bags. So thank you, and I'm glad you're all receptive to this. Good night. Thank you, thank you. Thank you once again, Councillor Borrego. Marianne, I would just love to say happy, Merry Christmas to you. It's great to see you. <laughs> thank you. Um, next item, 11 announcements, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, there will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Water Utility Authority meeting on Wednesday, December 19th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Griego Chambers. 
Thank you. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission meeting on Thursday, December 20th at 5 p.m. in the Vincent E. Grego Chambers. Next item is item 12, public hearings. We have AC 14, Dayan Hochman of, of Roy Ball Mac and Cordova agents for Larry Tucker appeal the decision of the Environmental Planning um, Commission. And Councilor Winter, he's not here right now, but he would be excused from this matter. Mr. Melendez. Thank you, Madam President. Appeal. Sure. The issue in this appeal is whether an existing conditionally permitted bed and breakfast within the Hewning Highlands Sector Development Plan should be specifically authorized through zoning to also host special events. This appeal is being processed under the zoning code. The application was started before the adoption of the IDO, and so it will proceed under the rules of the zoning code for purposes of this appeal. This is the second time that this matter has been before council. The EPC initially approved it, uh, and it came on appeal to council under AC 18.6. However, the City Council remanded it back to the EPC with instructions asking for clarification in the record and its findings. Specifically, the Council asked EPC to clarify how the proposed zoning was more advantageous as compared to the existing zoning at the site. The EPC did provide policy support for its prior approval, but it didn't um, articulate how this particular use was more advantageous than a use that might be possible within that existing zoning. Second, the council asked the EPC to clarify findings as to which special use category was intended. There's a couple that this use could potentially fit into. And finally, it asked the council, I'm sorry, the EPC to uh, identify and appropriately limit the proposed special events that might be permitted here. The EPC reviewed the matter um, on remand and bolstered its policy analysis relative to the special events component. It also clarified that it was treating this as what's being termed a B35 special use, which is a combination of uses, as opposed to a B7 use, which is specifically tailored for bed and breakfast special uses. However, the EPC did not place... Can you get the door? Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Melendres. No problem. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the EPC did not place limits on the special events at this location and instead recommended that they be limited through a, a different form of agreement. The LUHO reviewed the EPC recommendation and did determine that the ZMA request can be justified under the R270-1980 requirements that the Council had the EPC re-review. It also determined that the EPC had the discretion to categorize this use either as a bed and breakfast special use or a combination of uses. And since the EPC did not specifically impose limitations, the land use hearing officer evaluated what limitations might be appropriate and recommended a list of limitations, which would include that uh, special events at this location be limited to small gatherings of no more than 50 people, that they end by 10 p.m., and that no more than 24 per year occur. That's an approximate number. It's uh, one per week for three months, one per month for two months, and then one per week for two, two more months in the fall. And so it's a seven-month period across which they could have a total of around 24 events. The, with that, those limitations in place, the land use hearing officer recommends that the zone map amendment be appealed, I'm sorry, be approved, and that the EPC be affirmed. Tonight, you're considering whether to accept or reject that recommendation of the land use hearing officer. Um, you will not hear from the parties tonight. If you have questions about the appeal, I'll do my best to try to answer those from the record. If we cannot get the answers that you need or you need additional information, you can vote to reject the land use hearing officer's recommendation, in which case we'll schedule this matter for a full hearing at a later date. Thank you. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, um, Madam President. So, uh, what was a little more difficult to get was, was the, the complete record because it was huge, it was like that deep. Um, but we did have a paper copy and um, the, the very f top thing was the report that was, uh, came from Director uh, Campbell from planning. And uh, their summary is, does not agree with, uh, with LUHO in a couple of places. Uh, for example, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, uh, planning department found that the uh, 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 
let's see, where was I? Oh, although EPC found that the applicant adequately justified the zone change, um, and it clearly facilitates the, re the realization of the code um, that the, um, the EPC found that limitations on activities should not be placed on, um, for special events. And they thought that a private agreement would work out. But there's a few other things here. Um, they, um, in their response to the appellant's argument, they failed to specify, the EPC failed to specifically identify how the proposed zone change meets the clearly facilitates test. And um, that on the second point that, that we had charged them with, um, that the uses could be achieved with conditional uh, with a conditional use permitting. Um, so what, what makes me uneasy about this is that it's been through EPC twice. This is the second time it's come before council and, and the LUHO twice. And um, the appellant's questions still have not been um, answered. I, I guess the LUHO has tried to come up with, with some, you know, filling in the, the holes that EPC hasn't, which I think is really um, different uh, and out of character for EPC because usually they are so very thorough um, and, um, and complete in, their, in uh, their deliberations and reports that we get from them. So, um, I don't know that I'm ready to make, I, I, and I'm not even sure what, what motion to put up, but I, I, uh, I do have problems with this, and I'm afraid that other counselors may not have been able to have seen this uh, letter from uh, Director Campbell. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Um, I think this is a complicated one. I, I, I get both sides of it. In all fairness, if these, um, bed and breakfasts were to be licensed or approved under today's IDO, they would each, they would only get six per year. So I think in all fairness, since there are three of them, um, I would like to make a motion to accept the LUHO recommendation and findings with one amendment to the findings so that special events are limited to no more than six per year during the months of April through October per home. That would be a total of 18. There's a motion and a second to accept the LUHO recommendation with an amendment. And uh, Madam President, I just want to make some comments because this could go up to the um, district court. Uh, as we are right now, we have this appeal or this, I guess, application came under the old zoning code, but currently we're under the current zoning code, the IDO. And one of the things you can look at for a zone change is change circumstances. And under the, uh, the new IDO, we have a bed and breakfast. Now, there would be a couple problems that they'd have to get a conditional use permit. There might be a requirement. I think there is a requirement that there has to be a resident in each one of the houses. But uh, both of those things could be dealt with. But I think with that um, amendment that I'm supporting of Councilor Jones, I think we can really uh, pretty safely say this is pretty close to what the zoning is already. So it's a pretty small step to make this zone change. And it is very close to uh, what the a land use hearing officer proposed. I'm a little bit ambivalent because when I look at, I, if you look at, at High Street and I drove around there, if you have a really good arm, you could uh, actually hit um, Loveless Hospital with a rock from there. You wouldn't even need a very uh, strong arm to throw a rock in a swimming pool at the uh, hotel that's catty corner to the property or the outdoor swimming pool that's right on Central uh, down the street. So I, I think this is kind of a, kind of a quasi-urban, suburban, or, or residential neighborhood. It's, it really is in the midst of downtown. And I think uh, a full-on zone change would probably be um, justifiable. But this is kind of a, a little bit less of that full step uh, to actually change the zoning and just kind of make it uh, 
a little bit less aggressive zone change and make it more or less consistent with the IDO. So I think uh, th that's the direction I feel comfortable going. Thank you, Councilor Harris. Councilor Sanchez. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I have a question regarding just clarification, Councilor Jones. I do support the amendment, but basically what would not be changed is there shall be no special events during the months of November, December, January, February, and March of any year. Is that correct? Because that's basically what uh, the hearing officer examiner had made. That is correct. Included. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's a motion and a second to accept the Lou Ho's recommendations and findings, and then there um, is an amendment that Councillor Jones, I don't know if you want to kind of read that back in. Councillor Gibson? Yes. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, I make the motion to accept the Lujo recommendation and findings with one amendment to the findings so that special events are limited to no more than six per home per year during the months of April through October. Thank you. Count a clarification first. Councilor yeah, uh, Harris. I'd just like to make that uh, or a total of 18. I don't think that the, the owner of the B&B &B would have to do six here, six there, and six. But it's 18 total. I will accept that friendly amendment. Okay. Councilor Gibson. So we're making um, an, an exception to an R1 neighborhood, correct? It's an R1 neighborhood. Um, what would happen in 10 years if the current proprietors um, are gone, have sold it? Um, that would continue, I, I, I suppose, forever. What if someone else moves into the neighborhood and wants to do the same thing? So we would have potentially um, something happening, uh, could even be on the same day. Uh, if, if we allow 50 people at each one of these events, that's, we're probably talking 20, 25 cars on the streets. Now I understand that right now they have a provision for that, but we don't know that that's going to continue into the future or what other people would do if they wanted, if they also wanted a bed and breakfast with special events. Thank you. Councilor Borrego followed by Councilor Benton, then Councilor Jones. So, Did you want to respond to that? Um, Madam President, Council Borrego, um, I'll respond if there's a question. I don't think Council Gibson. Well, uh, I, I mean, the question that she asked is, you know, if does does the zoning the zoning goes with the property, not with the person. So, um, in uh, you know, I, I guess the question that I have though is we're. We're in the process of creating a bed and breakfast um, ordinance, Councilor Gibson is. And I'm just wondering how sort of this um, amendment would affect what, you know, what we're approving tonight. I mean, what Councilor Gibson's legislation, okay, how, so it, how it affects it. Thank you, Madam President, Councilor Borrego. So a few things there. So. Um, if a separate property owner were to launch a bed and breakfast in that particular community, then they would have the same right as anybody else to come in and request that use there. The particular lots in this area as part of the IDO process were converted to an R1B zoning district. Under that zoning district, a bed and breakfast use would be conditional. That means they'd have to take a trip in front of the city zoning hearing examiner and the zoning hearing examiner would make sure that the particular use as being requested would not harm um, the neighborhood. That's similar to a process that this use went through several, several years ago when it first got its conditional use. In evaluating that, the ZHE could look at a number of factors, including traffic, including whether or not a proliferation of the use is occurring in a way that is detrimental. So that would be the process in the event that a future proprietor wanted to come in. With respect to um, current uh, policy work that Councilor Gibson is spearheading, she may want to clarify herself, but the thing that she's dealing with is uh, uh, VRBO, vacation rental by owner, and Airbnb type uses. 
um, and that's a little bit separate than a bed and breakfast. Those are presently not regula regulated by the zoning code whatsoever, and under the current, current regulatory scheme of the city, um, that type of use can occur with no oversight by the city at this time, and I think there's a task force that's exploring whether or not some level of tracking or limitation might be appropriate for those, but it's a separate use than a bed and breakfast. Uh, Madam President, um, so basically what, what we are doing as a council, if we approve tonight the uh, LUHO's recommendation with the amendment, then basically what we're doing is we're taking the, the place, in a sense, of the um, conditional use hearing because it would move forward and it would be placed in perpetu perpetuity to the property, correct? Madam Chair, Councilor Borrego, conceptually, I think that's a, a, a good way, a reasonable way to think about it. Um, you know, technically, this particular property under its old zoning could have come in through a conditional use permit as well. The reason that I, I understand from the record that it chose a special use permit is that it was given guidance from the planning department that that would be a, a potentially more expedited way to address all three properties and to also get uh, conditions relative to the special events that they are proposing because under the sector plan under which they originally operated, there was a zoning determination made that special events were not permitted as part of their conditional use. So especially the special use process that we're in now um, is evaluating a lot of the same factors that the conditional use process would have evaluated, but it does come with the opportunity for them to request special events. So basically what we're doing though is we're setting a precedence for any future um, types of requests that are similar to this because we would have already established the number of um, you know, uh, events that could occur and so on. So we're sort of setting a precedence. Is that, is that not correct? Uh, Madam Chair, Council Borrego, potentially. And I'm not, I'm not opposed, I'm sure. just asking um, the question. Potentially, I mean, it could be guiding, but it's not binding. So, so every it's kind land of use, a guideline. Every land use matter that comes before the EPC or the council is judged by its own merits. And so to the extent that a particular use um, at a particular site because it's you know, facing a different direction. You know, there's a number of factors that could be evaluated that would make a different number of events more or less appropriate. And to the extent that somebody came in under the IDO, which they would now, um, the IDO would limit those special events to six. And there's not a clear path to getting around that in the IDO. And so I think that's what, what Councillor Jones's motion would do is it would uh, attempt to make the limitation consistent with the most current thinking as adopted by the IDO relative to special events. Councillor Benton. Uh, Mr. Melendez, so I know we're not considering the IDO, but it is adopted city policy, so I'm going to ask that, this question about it. So I understand that under the IDO, uh, there's some rationale to uh, Councillor Jones's uh, amendment. What does the IDO say about numbers, limitation of numbers at the special events, or does it? Uh, Madam President, Councillor Benton, the IDO speaks to special events in these terms. Um, only the following persons may eat meals in a bed and breakfast, and that's sort of the heading that prefaces it. Guests participating in meeting, private events, uh, essentially special events, um, but to the extent that special events occur uh, for guests beyond the number that can be accommodated in the facility for basically lodging and dining, uh, those special events um, are limited to no more than six days in any calendar year. Repeat the last, uh, limited to what now? Limited six. to no more than six days in any calendar year. Okay, and how about the number of attendees at the event, does it? The IDO um, is relatively silent on that. It talks about the number of guests that can be accommodated uh, overnight, it's related to the rooms, the number that can uh, be seated in the facility for dining purposes, but with respect to a special event, which pres would presumably exceed those numbers, the IDO doesn't guide that. It would be uh, related more to occupancy and, and fire department limits relative to the number of people that can be safely accommodated in the, in the dwelling. So these numbers, these limits that, that, that we've been discussing through this process have really just come about due to appeals and 
conditions asked by one party or the other. Madam President and Councilor Benton correct. The council, when it remanded to the EPC, asked for some, um, some <clears throat> thought into what type of limitations might be appropriate because as the way it originally came through, the special events were virtually unlimited. And so that, that may be a little more concerning in a residential neighborhood. Um, and so, yes, the number that we're looking at now has come about through discussions between the applicant, the appellant, and the land use hearing officer. And that's, what is, uh, that's where the land use hearing officer got the recommendation from, was based on the hearing with the applicant and the appellant. And can you remind me, uh, did the neighborhood associations weigh in on this? Madam President, Councilor Benton, they did. Huning Highland Neighborhood Association wrote a letter in support, as did the Edo Neighborhood Association. Thank you, Madam President. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, what we're really trying to do here is, is make it uh, so it's acceptable to the neighborhoods and the people living there and still make it something that the owner would like to do. Uh, this was permitted prior to the IDO passing. So if we can make it a, a reasonably close to the IDO, then it, it should work in the community and be profitable, hopefully, for the owner and be acceptable for the, the neighborhoods. Councilor Harris. In responding to uh, Councilor Borrego, I, I think a zone change is always so fact specific that, that there's never any precedent. There's a, all, under R270, 1980, there's so many different factors. You have to consider them all and weigh them all. And in this, it's a very unique situation where the IDO came into effect while the application was pending on appeal. And uh, I think this is just such a unique situation that we're really trying to narrowly tailor um, a very, uh, you know, sort of circumscribed um, zone change that sort of comports closely but not completely with the IDO. So I, th I think for that reason, I feel comfortable with it. Thank you. No other questions? Councillor Jones? Thank you, Madam President. I would urge your support of yeah, the recommendation, the acceptance of the Lujos recommendations with the amendment. Okay, so we don't have to um, vote on the amendment separately on this case? Madam President, no, it's, it's one motion to accept uh, with an amendment to the findings, which is a one motion for this purpose. Okay, so there's a motion and a second on the floor for, for that. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Yes. Mo that is a 7-1. Um, got it, yeah, okay. So the motion passes. Next item is B, this is AC18, the Group Agents for Vermont Hills Properties, LLC, appeal the decision of the Environmental Planning Commission. This appeal has been withdrawn by the appellant. Move um, withdrawal. Second. There's a motion and a second for withdrawal. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no, motion passes. Next item we have is um, number 13, approvals. There are none, so we are now on final actions. What time is it? So we're gonna go ahead and go on to item A, um, Councilor Davis 037. Thank you, Madam President. Item A 01837 uh, provides a new type of leave for city employees. Uh, as we know, currently the city does not provide any parental leave, and so employees must use their earned leave or take unpaid leave during FMLA or utilize short-term disability if they participate in short-term disability program. Uh, this amendment, or excuse me, this legislation uh, allows uh, the city to offer uh, parental leave for our employees who take on a new child or adoption or a number of limited circumstances for up to 12 weeks, which is consistent with the leave we currently offer them under FMLA, but unpaid. Uh, there's a lot of data here. I know the administration uh, has been working with us extensively on how we do this, uh, but I'm sure we can get to that through our conversations and debate. And so I would move 0 1837. There's a motion and a second for 01837. Any questions? Um, well, before we do that, I think we have public comment. I'm, I apologize for that. Um, Mr. Tad Naminsky, followed by Lisa um, Kunsen, followed by Pamela Herndon. Kunsen. Thank you. My name is Tad Naminsky. Well, I believe that the city council qualified as city employee. So, Council Davis, she always can adopt it and get one year off. That can, she can do it over, that's over, over, and ho I hope we lose that in the end. 
well, city council in ba baby making business. I hope we don't, don't have to have an abortion. I don't think so that will happen. That's right. One year for every working day and then second year off. Bo those, uh, both parents, I'm sure that's gonna be applied to both parents. And who's gonna pay? No, 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 that city is gonna pay. Municipal corporation. Well, municipal corporation, of course, but where this money comes from, the municipal corporation? From this middle class people. That's the one who pay taxes. Corp corporation don't, don't pay taxes. Big corporation. They're getting millions from the city council through economic development. Well, how about those poor people? They don't pay taxes. So, of course, middle class. That's, that's where we add. We all middle class. It's time. Oh yes, this is law. Become, of course, it's going to become law. Probably constitutional law. Oh, you just wait until I get done with you guys. Thank you. I'm done. Next speaker is Lisa Knudsen, followed by Pamela Herndon. Hello, Madam President. My name is Lisa Knutson. I'm a doctoral candidate at the University of New Mexico. My research area of focus is health policy with a, speci a specialty in breastfeeding and policies that support mother-baby dyads. I want to talk briefly about the benefits of paid parental leave that you're going to be considering this evening. A number of studies have shown that paid parental leave is a necessary measure to ensure infant health during a critical period of brain development. Paid parental leave results in three times more mothers initiating breastfeeding. Paid parental leave reduces risk factors for child abuse and neglect. Paid parental leave saves the city money by reducing employee turnover. And paid parental leave reduces the need for public assistance and reduces health care expenses. Finally, I want to thank every member of the council for your thoughtful work on this ordinance. If the city of Albuquerque approves this ordinance tonight, our city will serve as a shining example of how to support our working families. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Herndon. Good evening. I'm Pamela Herndon, President and CEO of the KWH Law Center for Social Justice and Change. Thank you for taking the first step among governmental entities in supporting a paid family leave policy in our state. There are three reasons to have this policy. It's great for new parents in a state where the well-being of children is ranked 49th in our country, giving parents a chance to bond with their children. It lets employees feel comfort in knowing that they are present for their children when their children need them most. And it gives a peace of mind to employees knowing that they have job security when they and their family need that job security the most. Most importantly, counselors, we applaud you for making this benefit available to every employee and not entangling it as a part of a collective bargaining agreement, showing your respect and support for every city employee. And we hope that the state of New Mexico will follow in your footsteps during the upcoming legislative session. Thank you, that was the last speaker. Um, Councillor Sanchez followed by Councillor Harris. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I have a floor amendment. It's floor amendment number one to O-18-37. And I want to thank Councillor Davis for this bill. I think this is going to be important to the uh, staff here at the city of Albuquerque, especially those mothers and individuals that are preparing to have a child and will have the time off and not have to worry about the PTO and the other issues that they are going to have to deal with. But let me read this uh, amendment. It says, uh, number one, on page one, line 20, strike the term one year and replace it with the term six months. Uh, this amendment will shorten the proposed time frame in which an employee must use parental leave after the qualifying event, birth, adoption, foster care placement uh, from one year to, six, to a six-month period. Second. 
There's a motion and a second for, for floor amendment number one. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We're back on the bill. Councilor Harris. Yes, thank you. I just want to clarify some things about my thoughts on this bill is that uh, one of the concerns I have is sometimes up here in a council will pass uh, ordinances that can have effect on private industry and can actually regulate what businesses do uh, in the economy and for instance the one that uh, we've been talking about for a while and there's a ballot initiative that has to do with the sick leave but that was a regulation of, of companies that aren't the city of Albuquerque. Here we are sitting as essentially the board of directors of a municipal corporation and I look at, at this as if, well, this is just kind of almost like a private matter within the corporation that we are deciding what we're going to do for our own employees. And at that point, it's just a question of whether or not we can afford it and whether or not we think it's for our own employees' uh, benefit and, and re retention and recruitment and so forth. So I just want to ask the administration, have you done an analysis of this and can we afford this and is, will it be good for retention and recruitment and so forth? Council President Pena, Councillor Harris, uh, yes, the administration supports this bill. We have the city economist, Christine, uh, I'm going to murder her last name, Boner, Boehner, <laughs> who's available to come down and make comments about it. I would just say that from a, a retention and recruiting perspective, this would set the city apart among our sort of government competitors and uh, should give us a competitive advantage in getting employees. Madam President and members of the council, uh, a lot of you did hear my overview of the presentation before. Would you like me to do a high-level summary of, of the cost estimates or just sort of? Uh, Madam President, for the media that are up there, probably sure. a good idea. Okay. So just a brief note um, regarding some of the, the data that we used in this study. Uh, the first one was a Department of Labor study in 2012. They do this study every so often. Uh, and they look at uh, Family Medical Leave Act and they interview 1,800 work sites and almost 3,000 employees to ask them about their experience with FMLA. We also relied on uh, HR records for the city for FY 16, 17, and 18, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we, we reviewed some studies, um, primarily a California study, a cost-benefit analysis that they used to estimate uh, the cost of their proposed new um, family policy, and uh, I'll mention that probably a couple of times. So you may not have this in front of you. Is it all right if I just sort of go with it? Okay. So the first cost, then, um, of the estimation, so we have historical data. We know people are using FMLA for the FY 16, 17, and 18, and we also know that people are using their own leave often to pay for this, sick leave or vacation leave, um, and they're using it concurrently with FMLA. However, a portion of the leave that they're taking is unpaid, right? And so uh, with regard to what it's going to cost the city moving forward, um, historically, there was a portion that was unpaid. Moving forward, that additional, that, that which was unpaid previously will be paid going forward, and so those are new costs that the city will, um, will incur. Now, you can't see this, but the estimate was between 140,000 um, in FY20 to 500,000 in FY20. And there's quite a range there, and the reason is because there are some anomalies in the HR data. We know how many days people are taking of FMLA, and we have an approximation for the number of hours they're using to cover that, right, whether it's sick leave, vacation, or unpaid. But for whatever reason, the number of hours doesn't quite match the number of days, all right, and so um, we had to assume that that gap might be unpaid leave, so there's a, that's why we have a, a spread there. Uh, and then another cost would be incremental overtime. Um, to the extent that people are taking FMLA, uh, the city's already paying overtime or paying for a temporary worker to cover for them. Uh, going forward, if this policy is implemented, we expect that there might be more leave takers and we expect that they might be taking more days of leave. So it's the additional cost of covering those um, extra days and those extra hours that, um, that people are taking. So the estimate there is an additional 50,000 to 75,000, all right? And then next, of course, a policy like this has a number of benefits, and, and you've heard um, you know, from others about this, but just trying to quantify um, the actual cost avoidance of a policy like this. 
just briefly, some studies have shown that people who are receiving paid leave will return to the same employer at a higher rate than people who are taking unpaid leave. And to be specific, 91.7% of people who are getting paid leave will return versus 80.2% um, who are not being paid. And then in addition, what we calculated was, well, how much does it cost to replace someone who's left, right? We did an internal estimate and we uh, determined that it takes about a little over $2,000, $2,084 to replace someone who's left. And keep in mind that these are just direct administrative costs, right? Posting the position, interviewing, et cetera. The actual cost of replacing someone who's left could be as high as 42,000 in some estimates, you know, when you take into account vacancy costs, training costs. And that estimate came from the New Mexico State uh, Personnel Board. Going back though to our conservative $2,000 of savings, we estimated that this policy could uh, bring back another 16 to 18 more people who otherwise might have left if they were taking unpaid leave. So that is a savings of between 33,000 and 37,000. So to summarize, the low estimate for a cost in, 20, in uh, FY20 would be about 157,000, and then the high estimate would be half a million, 538,000. Um, and another important, important part of this analysis that I had to mention, have to mention is that we can assume that if people are using FMLA paid leave um, for this leave and not their own vacation or their, no, or their own sick leave, they're likely accumulating additional leave that they would be able to cash out, right, upon retirement. However, this is, um, this is a, in a, a time far away from now. These are folks who are making, they're having their families, making their families, and retirement dates are quite a bit into the future. Uh, so it's difficult to know just how much extra leave might be cashed out and when that might happen. Uh, but it's, it's something we have to point out. Um, I did run an analysis. Well, I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and take questions. Thank, thank you, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Madam President. Just one question because I'm not clear on it. If if both parents are employees of the city, do both parents get the paid leave? Um, it's my understanding that they must share that leave. That they so there'd be a total of six months. Not. Let's ask Miss Nyer because mm -hmm. she's shaking her head now. Yes, we um, counselors. We have uh, Mary Scott, HR director. If she'd like to speak to that. Someone actually, Ms. Ms. Nair was going to speak yeah. to it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Council President Pena, uh, Councillor Jones. I'm happy to defer to the to the analysts and, and to Stephanie um, on this, but my understanding is that both parents would be eligible, as in each at the same time, because it's a six month period. So they would each take six months. It's not six months, but yes. It's well, six it's six yeah, months it's now. Six months. Okay. Thank but, you. It's 12 weeks that need to be used within six months, right? Yeah. Okay, so it would be both of them within six months. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, we'll go to Councillor Davis to close. Thank you, Madam President, and thank you so much. I want to really, I, I can't say enough about the, the work of the administration and Ms. Scott and her team, uh, Mr. Stewart, Ms. Nyer, your team, for really helping us figure out how a policy like this might apply to our city and helping us get the right data so that we weren't guessing based on someone else's experience around the country. Um, our staff, including Sean in our office and others, have done a lot of work on this. Um, at the end of the day, I think Ms. Herndon sort of laid it out best uh, when she talks about our crisis on child well-being in, the, in our state and in our city. And this is, in part, one way our city can lead and create an example um, and really do something uh, dramatic in terms of changing those outcomes. We know that this works, um, but more importantly for our city, our workforce is getting older. Uh, we are competing against other more flexible uh, workplaces now uh, for a new generation of employees that want something different. They want and value community and family. They look for their employers that, value, that recognize and reward those values. And after all, we invest in our employees um, to have, especially our younger employees who are starting a family, uh, trade all that in, our investment in, and leave our city in order to make a decision to work to devote to their family on a short time makes a difference on our bottom line as well. Uh, as someone pretty smart uh, mentioned to me today, at the end of the day, we are um, already um, 
budgeting every year for the full salaries for every city employee that we have. Anybody who was having to use FMLA in the past uh, was doing so at a vacancy savings for our city, not at a new cost. Um, and so we were essentially saving money on the backs of our employees um, by forcing them to take unpaid leave when they choose to have a child. And we can do better, and quite frankly, we can afford it. And so, I, Councilor Sanchez, thanks for your amendment. I appreciate our conversations today and working to make this better and work for us better. I encourage other councilors to support it so we can build a better workforce and reward our employees who reward and come to work every day for us. So thank you and urge your support. Thank you, Councilor Davis. There's a motion, a second on the floor to um, approve O37. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item we have is um, R105, Councilor Borrego and Benton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, R18105, or I'm sorry, Madam President, um, is basically urging, urging the newly elected Honorable Governor of New Mexico and the state legislature to petition the United States Congress to reauthorize the Rail Passenger Services Act with amendments ad addressing discontinuing, modifying, or suspending services. And basically what this does is it um, recommends to our legislature that um, they recommend to Congress um, basically board governance and um, improvements in um, how we um, sort of um, view the railroad and sort of um, how it affects New Mexico and just reauthorizing that they actually support our services for New Mexico and um, and uh, look at it as an economic development um, uh, transportation issue for our state. So there's a motion. Okay, Councilor, so, uh, would you like to? I don't think we moved it yet. I'd like to move that we approve this. Second. There's a motion to second the floor for a new pass of R105. Councilor Beckham. Mm -hmm. uh, Sorry. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam President. Yeah, the, uh, this has some similar language to some previous uh, le resolutions that we've passed in the recent past, but uh, we've really got a different situation now in that um, our delegation, our, our Washington delegation, has, uh, has stepped up to, uh, to reauthorize with these amendments that would really protect uh, the process more than anything, uh, the past couple of resolutions we've had about the Amtrak and the Southwest Chief have, have had to do with um, sort of abrupt changes that were administratively announced in Washington and uh, with, under, under the, the current administration. And um, so this is really uh, trying to get our entire state on board behind our federal delegation uh, with, with what they've done. And it's not just them, it's also uh, senators and representatives, for, as far as I understand, from uh, Kansas or, uh, and Colorado as well, so. Thank you, there's no one signed up to speak. Councilor Gibson, did you have? Okay, the administration, we're good. <laughs> there's a motion and a second for a do pass. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no, motion passes. Um, we're done with item D. We're on item E, Councilor Davis, R110. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and if, with your permission, we'd like to just discuss item E and item F together since they both relate to the same item. Uh, item E is R18110, consents to the assignment of the Master Development Agreement for Mesa del Sol Tax Increment Development Districts 1 through 5 uh, by and among the City of Albuquerque. Uh, blah, 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 and amended and substituted in certain other related in connection with the purchase of the property by MDS Investments for the purpose of the financing the public infrastructure there. Uh, in short, uh, Madam President, and we can, we have some presentations very briefly, I believe, uh, from the developer at Mesa del Sol and uh, uh, cities, uh, Mr. Mosesman from 360, 360 uh, that's here. Uh, this is the final culmination of more than a year's worth of work uh, for the new owner of the Mesa del Sol development that was abandoned um, in more than 10 years ago now, um, that's now back on track. 
Uh, the TID boards and the PID boards have been working with the developer um, through the process to determine their ability to implement the development plan and uh, has recommended to this council that we approve that assignment. And so we have those folks with us tonight. So I would move item E for approval. Um, great. Councilor Davis, did you want to move the floor sub before we have the developers come up or did you want to have them come I up? I believe we do. Yes, ma'am. The floor sub just includes uh, amendments, which includes the packet of information that's been available in the iPad. So I would move the floor sub on item E. Second. So this is a motion and second for the floor substitute for R110. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We're back on the bill. Thank you, Madam. Uh, Madam President, please, I'd like to ask Mr. Mosesman, Mr. Mosesman to come up on behalf of the TID board just to present very briefly sort of the fiscal impact here and the financial background. Madam Chair, uh, Councilors, my name is Mitch Mosesman. I'm with the firm of 3360 Public Financed. Uh, we were engaged or have been engaged to, uh, in connection with the due diligence effort, to review the uh, developer's performa for the project, as well as the projections on the public financing side. So we, re we reviewed the PID projections and the TID projections. We reviewed the fidelity of the model, if you will, whether it's accurate internally in terms of its math, so forth and so on. We initially did a review in September and presented that to the TID and PID boards in October and made some recommendations the model was subsequently revised. We went through a series of iterations and back and forth feedback and uh, finalized our, uh, our report subsequent to that. So we kind of had two passes to this and I have a, a brief table that kind of summarizes where we were initially and where we are today and, and I can walk you through that so you get a high level um, feel for, um, for the performa and for our analysis. So this is a large project. Uh, initially, the, the models showed revenues of roughly $880 million over the remaining life of the project against $505 million in expenditures for net cash flow of about $374 million. And one of the changes that we requested is that the infrastructure costs be updated to today's uh, unit pricing. And we also uh, built our own model for the, uh, for the public improvement district and inserted that into the performa. And as a result um, of the uh, updating of the infrastructure costs, we now have um, revenues of about 969 million. The bulk of that increase is attributable to higher increases for reimbursement of public infrastructure because the infrastructure costs went up, but we also have much higher expenditures to the tune of 800 million. So we have net cash flow of $166 million. That's where we sit today. The internal rate of return went from roughly 50% to down to about 13.2%. And so what you, if you look at the, the sales revenues that are projected, they're about 664 million. Those are less than the actual projected infrastructure costs at this point. And we're, we're looking at what's referred to for Mesa del Sol as the original 3,000 acre uh, infrastructure cost estimate adjusted for work completed to date and work anticipated to be completed by others also adjusted for the, the unit price increases. So uh, that's a very high level, but you, you, know, you come away with uh, uh, I think a, a clear conclusion that the public financing is a key component to this project. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you. Any questions? Councillor Davis, administration, any comments, questions? Councillor Davis to close. Uh, actually, and thank you, Madam President. If briefly, uh, Mr. Chavez, who is the developer for the new Mesa del Sol group, uh, I believe had some comments he wanted to make to the board as the new developer just to introduce sort of the plan there, uh, if we'd be able to give him a minute or two, if that'd sure. be okay. He's tall. <laughs> well, good evening, Madam President, Council. Thank you for your time this evening. Really appreciate it. I'm, uh, my name is Steve Chavez. I'm a local businessman here in New Mexico. I was born and raised here. And we are, well, my company is in the controlling interest of Mesa del Sol. 
And what we were asking today is we, before you deny, ask that you consent to the assignment of Mesa del Sol, um, TID and PID districts to MDS investments. As you probably know, due to the difficult economic times and the climate and inter internal disagreements, the original developer of Mesa del Sol entered foreclosure several years ago. We purchased the underlying property and the development rights out of foreclosure and have begun on exciting process of revitalizing the development. From Netflix, a data center campus, a new grocery store, several houses, are there are some of the incredible things happening on Mesa del Sol and we want to continue driving the momentum and create jobs and housing opportunities for Albuquerque citizens. We have a lot of exciting prospects on the horizon. As part of the district's team, we need the city's consent to continue our work with the districts and we need the districts in order to make the projects work. So we hope you agree to this partnership. We look forward to working with the city on this exciting project and I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Um, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, hearing no other comment, uh, I would move to close and urge your support on this. This is a project this council consented to 10 years ago um, to get started, and we're excited to have local people um, who've come back to develop this and take the lead and have already shown promise in getting that started, um, and so I would urge your support. Absolutely. Um, so there's a motion and a second on the floor for approval of R110. All those in favor say yes. yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Next item is F, um, R111. Uh, Councilor Davis. Thank you, Madam President. We won't have to spend as much time here. I make a motion to approve R18111. Second. There's a motion, a second, to approve, uh, approve uh, R111, but there's a floor sub. Yes, ma'am. And Madam President, I move the floor sub for R111. There's a, there's a motion, a second, for the floor sub. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. And no one signed up to speak. Administration does want to add any comments. Okay, here we go. Councilor Davis to Urge close. Your support. There's a motion and a second for R111. All those in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed, no. Motion passes. Congratulations. Next item is item G, Councilor Benton, R115. Thank you, Madam President. R115 is establishing legislative and budget priorities for the seat of Albuquerque for the 2019 New Mexico State Legislature. I move a due pass. Second. And uh, Madam President, this is really just a uh, slight cleanup to the bill that we already passed for our legislative and budget priorities. Uh, there were some uh, District 2 projects that were left out, uh, and we also got some feedback from our legislatures, legislators at the state uh, in some informal meetings, uh, and we wanted to clarify the local match, if you will, that, that the city is committed to on these projects. Um, and then I think there were also a few uh, uh, miscellaneous projects added from other districts in the uh, neighborhood projects. So. Thank you, Councilor Benton. So there's a motion, a second of a due pass of R115. I actually have uh, floor amendment number one. Uh, this is on page eight after line seven, insert the following Westgate Little League Baseball Complex Improvements Plan Design Construct and Equip Improvements to the Westgate Little League Baseball Complex. On page eight, line, line eight, delete 65 and replace in lieu of their, um, the following 66. Explanation is adds improvements to the Westgate Little League Complex to the list of the neighborhood improvement priority projects that comprise section three of the resolution. I, I move approval. Okay. There's a motion and a second for approval of amendment number one. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We're back on the bill. Madam President, I have an amendment. Okay. I don't have a copy of the amendment. This would be floor amendment number two to R-18-115. Okay. And it reads on uh, line one, page 10, after line 25, insert the following. Encouraging the New Mexico legislature to continue funding the New Mexico Department of Transportation to complete the acquisition of right-of-way for sale down already at the location of the corridor future interchange with Interstate 40, so as to improve access to the community facilities, including the Metropolitan Detention Center, Sierra Colorado landfill, the Albuquerque shooting range, and the future economic development at Double Eagle 2 Airport. 
There's a motion and a second for approval of floor amendment number two. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. We're back on the bill. Any other amendments? With that, I will um, give it to Councilor Benton to close. Where's your support? So there's a motion and a second um, for R115 as amended. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. Um, next item is other business, but um, should I clarify that I should have said as substituted on the last two bills? We're good? Okay. So um, the next item is approval of the committee appointments. Um, everyone has a copy. There was a couple of, a, of changes um, that we did later today that I talked to um, all of the counselors in relation to those changes. So I would move approval of the committee appointments dated December 17th. There's a motion and a second for approval of the committee appointments. All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed, no. Motion passes. There be no further business. This council meeting is adjourned. Thank you.